Alright, well thank you all for coming. This is being filmed as part of my film of the BA Honest History Degree at Sheffield Hallam. This is going to go online. Don't worry though, you can applaud as loud as you want. Don't worry about that. But this is what it's all about now, public history and how much it is important to everyday Britons. This is it then, Silverwood Colliery and me. This is a photo taken in 1993. The pit closed the following, the following year in 1994. Um, it is here in the village of Roth in Ravenfield, South Yorkshire, very, very near Rotherham. Ravenfield itself is just up there behind those trees in the forest. You can see there's a line of old pit houses there. And this, as you can probably have a guess at, is the old entrance to the mine. Credit for this actually goes to a man who wasn't a photographer, but he did have a large part to play in the history of Silverwood. Uh, goes to a man named Victor Gordon Atkins, who started out as an electrical apprentice in 1949. He eventually left Silverwood 16 years later in 1965, handing his notice in and then going on to work in the steelworks. He does still live, I've had the pleasure of meeting, Vic I mean, meeting Victor, and although people do call him Vic, I tend to just stick with Grandad. <laughs> that works? I'm just going to run through some basic facts quickly now, if you have to worry about that. So Silverwood first sank in the early 1900s by the Dalton Main Collieries Limited Company. This was a huge mining company within South Yorkshire. It ran many, many of the pits around the area. Now, Barnsley Coal Seam, which I'll show you in a, in a moment, stretched for miles underneath the surrounding ground. If I do that, it's right underneath your feet right now, the old coal seam. How big it, how, just to show how big it was. And the first piece of turf, in fact, was actually cut from 1905, but as you saw, it started sinking in 1900. So it took five years for the first bit of coal to be extracted. When it was up and running, though, fantastic numbers in terms of coal. So it operated for almost nine decades, as a matter of fact. It closed two days before Christmas in 1994, which is not a very good Christmas present, you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Left 378 men either jobless or having to move to nearby, other nearby collieries. But this was the 90s. Fortunately, not many collieries are still open. Uh, so this is a photo I managed to find, <coughs> actually, just lying around but near where the colliery used to be. It's on a wall. I don't actually know the... Um, evidence the provenance for it, but as you can see it does clearly say Dalton Main Collieries Limited. And what I've been able to find out from people is that, although I don't know who shot it or when, this was one of the many many tracks that was used in Silverwood to help tip the coal to surrounding areas. But one of the things that I think is important is that Silverwood, one of the reasons for its success was they built a coal railway straight running from the pit out into the surrounding land. The tracks are still there, if you know where to look. This was a survey done, ordered by Queen Victoria for Parliament in the mid-19th century. By way of well known survey, although unfortunately I can't remember his name at the moment in time. But, just put it in a bit of perspective, so there's Rotherham, Sheffield, Tickhill, Silverwood, right around there. As you can see at the time, that was a lot of coal had to get the teeth into. This was before the pit was open. As you can imagine, it showed a lot more land than we thought they would have had. And this is a really interesting photograph. This is a man named Edward Jones, who was born in Derbyshire in 1867 on the 29th of February. Not a good day, I know. <laughs> yeah. His family came from Wolverhampton originally. He himself was born in Derbyshire. But the important thing is that Edward here was one of the first miners in Silverwood. He moved his family towards South Yorkshire and there they settled and Edward himself got a job down the mine and obviously he became breadwinner for the family. It helped his family thrive. In fact, his relatives are still here in South Yorkshire today, nearly 100 years later. Believe me, I should know. He's my great-great-grandfather. <laughs> but yes, as I say, that is a family photo, a family photo and that's one of the important things about Silverwood and about heritage itself. Because it's not just you know, a name on a page, it is for many people family. Especially why it means so much to me, because this is my family history. I'm just going to run through some numbers now, so don't worry about that. But yeah, so in the 1960s, Silverwood produced 1.1 million metric tons of coal a year. That was an average. Still can imagine, though, a million tons a year. That's quite impressive. That's quite, it's quite impressive. And 1,500, 1500 men helped that. You had everything from miners to surveyors to excavators and canteen people. No matter what, everyone came and helped out in whatever capacity they could. So, in 1989, same year as the fall of the Berlin Wall, here in Yorkshire, Silverwood became the first mine to extract the fastest million tons of coal. 
And to put that into pers perspective, at that time, in 1989, there were 56 collieries open in South Yorkshire. Silverwood was the fastest out of all of them. 56. Mm. However, though, that was still fail in comparison to the average amount, which in 1992, there was 1.4 million tonnes of extractors. That set a record, that smashed all records at the time. And this was held because, they, because unlike other mines, Silverwood, people saw promise in it and there was so much investment into it. So much so that by this time, Silverwood was the most technologically advanced coal mine in all of Europe. More money went into computers and it helped so much with the extraction of coal. Very important. I think we might all know this lady here. Yeah, this is Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. This was a visit in 1975 to Silverwood. As Ken, she was doing a tour of mines in the area, but mainly she wanted to stop off at Silverwood. She heard about the great things about her. So many of these men here did take her down the pit and she saw exactly what was happening. I believe she's even left with a bit of coal, maybe. I've heard that from a local, though, so I don't know how much truth there is in it. But we shall see. It's in fact the second time the royals visited the pit. So in 1912, the reigning, ki the reigning king, King George V, he visited. However, his visit was cut short by a disaster at the local pit, and he left suddenly early. And while it is all great looking at how fantastic it was in heating homes, because without coal, a lot of us wouldn't be here. And every, well, a lot of us wouldn't be here without the Industrial Revolution, and so on. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows, sadly. Because on February the, on February the 3rd, 1966, the Paddy Mail disaster occurred. This was truly horrific. This is an example of a Paddy Mail train. I've got that book from Google just to show what I mean. It's very simple. It's a diesel locomotive that could pull this sort of track behind it. And on that, you could go materials, you could go men, do whatever you need to get around the pit quickly underground. Now, the day shift on February the 3rd were riding as they were into the pit face. Then a second paddy metal train behind it ran out of control. That one was carrying materials, meaning it was a lot heavier. Sadly, both collided. Nine miners were killed instantly at the scene, and one died three days later in hospital. This isn't the paddy metal disaster, it is infamous. And yeah, it just shows the price that goes to pay, but I think it's something that should not be forgotten. These miners are doing a mm. job to help everyone else. Apologies for the quality, but this is, yeah, a newspaper printed on February the 3rd the same day as the disaster. I know I can't make out very well, but just say, six killed in Yorkshire pit disaster. This itself is from the Coventry Evening Telegraph. That's in Coventry, not, not Rotherham. That shows just how far and how widespread the disaster was in mining communities. Because it linked people, very simply. Everyone in that occupation. This is now sadly all that is left of the pit. As I said, it closed in 1994. And here in 2019, we have the old Winding Wheel, which stands as a monument to those miners who well, did work down there and those who unfortunately died at the pit. Here we have, this used to be the old pit face and it's also a landfill which is now being renovated and it now stands with Woodlater Village, complete housing estate, also it has its own lake and its own recreation grounds, all made from the land that used to be the pit. Now there at the base, and we'll zoom in one, yes. So it's dedicated to the men who did, unfortunately, die, and also those who did work down there. Remember them with pride. I think that's important. I think it really is because, so to them, it was, to, it was a job. But now in the grand scheme of things, we know it was much more than just that. These men gave their lives to help Britain forward in ways that I can barely think of. Without coal, no machines, no cars, nothing. I think in a rather cheesy way, I think he put the great in Great Britain. <laughs> 1949 was ready for leaving school. A neighbour of ours, Mr. Barber, who was a train officer at Silver Covery, came and asked my mother what I wanted to do. She, and she says, Oh, I don't know really. She, she says, Why? She said, I've got a, he said, I've got a vacancy for an electrician at Silver Covery. I don't know if he's interested or not. And she said, I'll ask his dad when he came, comes in from work, which he, he did. And my dad came in from work and said, I don't think he can go, whatever he wants to do. And uh, that's how I come to start at Silver Curry. And I worked there until 1965 when I left and I went into the steelworks. And, and I, was a, I 
I was grateful for the training I should work on it because it was a good training as an electrician. And we were looked up to and see the electricians all over the place because it was a, it's a good training program. And I think that That was yeah, the voice of Victor Atkins, same man as the photo at the beginning, the voice of my granddad, who very nicely said sat down and said those things. As he said though, it was grateful because electricians were very sought after in during this time period, because electricity itself, not many people knew about it as they do today. The benefit though was that my granddad was able to forge a living for himself. He still lives near the old pit, near the old pit, and luckily my family has such a strong pit, has such a strong connection with the pit because of this. I think that's what sparked my interest in it, which keep other people interested in it as well. Now we just have the references, places I've managed to look up and find more information off it. I think that's just about all. I just want to say thank you all for coming. So this is going to get uploaded, so thanks for not uploading too loudly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do. Thank you very much then.